proclaiming the gospel throughout the world. Bill Winston Ministries is bringing lost souls to Jesus Christ and teaching them how to walk in a victorious life. We invite you to receive all the blessings that God has for your life. Bill Winston Ministries presents The Believer's Walk of Faith. Says here, and we're dealing with Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, if you'll see here, he's saying, be not conformed to this world. Now, that word conformed, that means to uh, fashion or configure or to adopt the customs of, to be squeezed into the world's mold. And it says, uh, but be ye transformed, that is changed, and we said that word transforms comes from a Greek word that we get the word metamorphosis. Now we look at the word metamorphosis, one of the ways we know that word to be commonly used is when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and comes out as a butterfly. So now we're saying here that um, we're uh, going to be transformed, and it says by the renewing of your mind. And that transformation will take place by the renewing of our minds. And that word renew there, uh, we get the word renovate just like you'd get an old house and renovate this old house. So what we're doing here now is discovering how to renew our minds. Again, I said it really happened when uh, during this last election and uh, one president and the other president looked like we had a group of people on one president's side, the other group on another president's side, and, and I don't know how it got down to this point, but it seemed like it almost got set up where races were against each other. And it was just a foul mess. I had never seen anything like it in my life. Now, I know who was behind it because uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We know that the enemy was behind it, but I was just surprised that Christians were being used like that. Now, I began to go into it and try to discover what was the reason for that happening and then I begin to come down with the fact that the minds have not been renewed. Now what has happened is people have been brought out of bondage, meaning you have been saved, born again, but now we got to get your mind saved. We got to get the minds of God's people into a place where they're thinking like God and not thinking like that old person who they used to be. Now, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, Adam walked and talked with God. He walked and talked with God. Some people say that God must have had a physical form, you know, because it said when, when Adam sinned, he went and hid from God, you know. He, he, he knew where God wasn't. And uh, <laughs> so he went and hid from God, but it, he, he walked and talked with God. Now, we said that when Adam was created, mankind was created, they're created uh, in three parts, tripartite being a spirit, soul, and a body. Now that body was a contactless natural world. Enjoy the things of the world. The soul, of course, is contacting the body through the thought process. It's a place where knowledge is stored and memory is stored. Then you have the spirit, which is a part that actually talks to God. So the spirit of man was made to fellowship with God, to talk with God, to fellowship and, and, and co directly communicate with God. However, when, when God told Adam, don't eat of this particular tree. Now, one of the things that God gave mankind is a free will. He has a free moral agency. And in that free will, God works to protect that will. 
because he even protects it against him violating that. He wants, in all cases, to leave you with a freedom of choice. So Adam chose, and he chose a tree, and, and, and he chose to do something that God didn't say do. Now, what happened was Satan, of course, came through a serpent and beguiled Eve, and Eve was deceived. But the Bible says Adam was not deceived. He knew better. So he, the Bible says, or some theologians say, he committed treason. Treason is when you sell out your nation, or in this case, sell out us. Praise the Lord. And, and in the case of, of this particular situation, it was devastating. So the choice that people make is never something that merely affects their life. The choice that people make affects other people's lives. So now, I, I discovered that when I was coming in, in the, into the ministry. And, um, you know, it, it, it's like one time God kind of showed me that some people were outside of the waiting room. There was a doctor in the office, but he didn't, he didn't put the shingle out that said open for business. He, he kind of was staying in the office just kind of doing busy work and all these people lining up out there and waiting for the doctor's office to open. And God kind of showed me that what, way back when that, hey, son, you got to go into the, to the ministry because a lot of people waiting on what you've got. Amen. See, I'm just saying, not that I'm so important, but they're waiting on what you've got. And what God wants you to do is make the right decision so that you can fulfill the destiny that God has for your life. And in the process, a whole lot of other people get touched. Amen. A whole lot of other people get blessed. Say amen to that. Amen. All right, so... Uh, we're saying here for us to get, uh, oh, once uh, Adam sinned, God put him out of the garden, he and Eve, and, and as that happened, now Adam lost that connection with God through the Spirit. Uh, the uh, light went out, so to speak. The receiver was gone. And now God had to get other means to be able to uh, teach or instruct his man. Now, God didn't do away with mankind. He had a plan called a plan of redemption. And in that plan of redemption, God then had his son to come into the earth, which was the Bible calls the last Adam, and he came into the earth, and he said that those that believe in him, he said that, that um, uh, he came to bring us life. And, and he came to restore that life, uh, that light, and that connection that we had with God. So once he did, he restored that life. Now, and that connection. Now, I want to, I said something before, but I want to say it again. Remember now that, that in the Garden of Eden, there was no University of Chicago, Northwestern, University of Illinois. There was none of that. Because once man was talking directly to the source, he didn't need education. See, he didn't need, he didn't learn, he just discerned. Are you following what I'm saying? That was the original way that God would teach his man. It's through discernment. And so now, once mankind fell, now the next thing you got to have is you got to have education. Because there is an instruction that comes from the outside. And it's based on reason. Well, once the enemy got a hold of that, what he did was he affected those five senses. In other words, he could set up circumstances or do things, and through those things, he could partake in the instruction of, of God's man. And I'm only saying that because once a person is receiving their signal and their information totally from the outside, then they're subject to be deceived because the enemy is a deceiver. I mean, you know yourself today you can get a magician and he can pull a rabbit out of a hat or whatever card trick they do. And then somebody will come up and he'll call you up and say, well, now how did I do that? And you say, I don't know. He said, well, just stand here and watch me. And you still don't know. In other words, the hand is quicker than the eye. So I'm just saying that the enemy came in through the senses and was able to deceive mankind. The Bible says in Revelation, he deceived the whole world. So what men thought was right was wrong because it felt right. So you can't go by your feelings. So what now God does is God comes back with instruction 
but he gives us instruction, one, through the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm going to give you a teacher, and he's going to come to you, and he's going to teach you, and the way that we learn is through revelation, that God, through the Holy Ghost, talks directly to our spirit, and through our spirit, now we can get information. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20, if you will, and Proverbs chapter 20. <clears throat> it's very important that you get what I'm saying here. I'm giving a little bit of a, a lengthy uh, introduction, but I'm doing that because um, you need to catch everything that I'm saying that's regarding here because I'm going to go into some places today that I don't want to lose anybody. All right, look what it says here in Proverbs chapter 20. And let me know if you get there by saying, Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27. The spirit of man is the what of the Lord? The candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now that word candle, my center column reference says lamp. So the spirit of the Lord, uh, sorry, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Now you know yourself, the Bible says, the entrance of his word giveth what? light. So the light is a word of God. It comes in and lights the candle. Now then you take a candle. What do you do with a candle? Come on, somebody. You light a dark room or go into a dark place. You see where you're going. Right. Jesus said, he that has no light, he's in darkness and he stumbleth. He said, I am the light of the world. Now the word of God brings light. Now what he lights is your candle. Where is a candle? Your spirit. So what he does is light your spirit. So God uses your spirit to guide you. God uses your spirit to guide you. That's why many times when you're seeking God for answers, when the answer finally comes, it sounds like yourself. Because it comes from you. He uses your spirit to guide you. Are you with me? All right, so uh, now, in this, we now, by the renewing of our minds, glory to God, we have to renew our minds to how we're thinking. And the main purpose of that is so that we could fulfill our purpose and our destiny. Because how we're thinking has a lot to do with where we're going. I like what one man, Bob Harrison, came here and he preached. He said, you will always go and move in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. Boy, that's kind of interesting. That was a profound truth. But anyway, <clears throat> so now we said that the enemy is after the mind, or we said your soul. So we said the war is on for the soul, S-O-U-L. So now why is the war on for the soul? First, because the soul is where decisions are made. It's where decisions are made. And your life is a sum total of the decisions that you are made. Remember what I said. Now, God is going to perfect, protect your free moral agency. He's going to protect that. So in your decision is what the enemy wants. So what he'll do is he'll try to influence your decisions. In many ways, he'll come in and try to either uh, influence them one way or the other. Now, God is the same way. God is trying to influence your decisions and, and, and protect your decisions, but influence your decisions to go his way. Now, when the enemy comes in to influence decisions, he comes in through circumstances, and he's trying to get you to look at those circumstances and make a decision based on what you see. He'll try to use people sometimes who, uh, they don't mean any harm, but they just, uh, they just ain't got no sense. I mean, they just, they just, uh, are you following what I'm saying? They just, they just, they're being used by the enemy and don't realize that they're being used by the enemy. Matter of fact, many times they think they're doing good. I mean, the apostle Paul was very zealous for, for carrying Christians off to jail, but was he doing good? No, he wasn't doing good. He discovered that he was doing the wrong thing. I remember one time that um, I went into a, uh, a, 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 I read a case where a man was uh, praying and he was praying for a certain city. And what happened after he got done praying, he went to witness. Now these cities that were, were, uh, were there were two cities side by side. And what split these cities was a big road, uh, a main a highway or something. And they split these two cities. 
he would go to one side that he had prayed for and he would witness to people and give them tracts and they'd take them gladly. Then he'd go to the other side right across the road and try to give them to people and nobody would take any. So it's interesting how the enemy had influenced the people on one side not to take any and how the, the, the powers of the devil were broken off the other side and they would take some. I remember one time I was witnessing, this was in Minnesota, I was witnessing and I was going out and witnessing, give people tracts and so forth. And I said, let me go down here to this big grocery store or whatever store it was. I think it was uh, uh, some kind of merchandising store, but it was a big department store. And I said, I'm going to just stand by the door here, not, not too close to the door, but I'm going to give these people these tracts when they go in. And then I start giving people tracts and they were taking them. But then nobody else was coming to my door. They were all going to the next door over there. So I said, all right, devil, I'm going to that door. So I went to that door, and people started coming, started giving them tracks. Pretty soon that door dried up. And they all went to this door over here. Let me tell you, the enemy tries to influence people so that they'll make a decision so that they can do the things that he wants them to do so that he can build his kingdom here in this earth. So one of the main things that God has is giving you decisions. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 30, he said, I place before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. So life is choice driven. The next the reason why the enemy is after your soul, because whoever controls the soul controls the experiences in life and controls the destiny. So we see now that because of Adam's sin, Adam fell. And because of Adam's fall, the whole human race fell. So notice that the destiny of a lot of people were affected because of this one man. Now, let's go over to Proverbs chapter 21. And over in Proverbs chapter 21, he said what to do with our soul because God wants us to guard our soul. Look at Proverbs 21 and look at verse 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his what? Soul from troubles. So one of the things we want to find, we found out is over in Proverbs chapter 30, he said, if you have a wrong thought, put your hand over your mouth because the enemy wants you to release it. Uh, uh, the psalmist David said something that was very interesting. He said in on Psalm chapter 39 in verse 1, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth like with a bridle while the wicked is before me. So many times the devil is standing before people that can't see him because he's a spirit and he's waiting on authorization to be able to do something that comes through our speech. Now look what it says also in Proverbs chapter 22 and verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship with a what kind of man? An angry man. Now this is God. This is Proverbs. This is wisdom. You say, well, they, they're my close friend. I don't care. Here's what it says, because the devil is after your soul. Why? Because he's after your destiny. Not only is he after your destiny, he's after your family. He's after your money. He's after your heritage. He's trying to make it so you won't inherit squat, so that your children will be on just as broke as some of the other family members. He wants to do that. So what you need to do is say, wait a minute, God said it in his word, so I'm going to believe that. I'm going to get up around those people that are angry because he said, if you make friendship with an angry man and with a furious man, thou shalt not go lest you learn his ways. Glory to God. And get a snare to your soul. It's a lot of people, you know, they think they know more than God. And sometimes they be, you know how to be kind of just toying with, with the devil. And so for God told you don't go out with a man. If you, if you married, you, you don't need to be hanging out with a person. And, 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 and no, let me say, if you're, not, if you're saved, you don't need to be hanging out with a person and going out with a man or a woman going out with a, a man or a man going out with a woman and taking them out and so forth and getting close to them and they're not saved. Now, one of the first things you say is, well, I'm going to get them saved. Listen, I don't know how many people tried that and end up getting caught in a trap. Now, my, my point, I don't know how I got on that, but I'm going I'm to just all I'm going to say about that. Come on Wednesday night. I'm teaching on marriage and the family. Hey, 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 hey. Now, <clears throat> so we have to guard our soul. Now, one of the words, things that also the enemy works is something called discouragement. Say discouragement. 
Now, he's still after a soul. Turn to 1 Samuel, please, and chapter 30. You just turn there and turn there quickly because I'm moving on. 1 Samuel chapter 30. The enemy works with discouragement. He wants to discourage you. It's the opposite of courage. He wants to discourage. He wants to make it so that you don't have the strength to follow through on what uh, perhaps is needful for you to follow through. For you to get discouraged at the job, in your marriage, with your kids, or whatever have you. He's after your soul. This is a case where David came back from fighting a big battle. They got victory, but they came back to the city, big zigzag. And when they came back to this city, all of a sudden they saw the city had been burned by the enemy, and their wives and their children and their stuff had been taken off. How would you like to have come in from a hard day's work and somebody stole all the furniture in your house? Come on, some, some, that could discourage you just a little bit. But what happened was, and David, then he, uh, his men got even mad at him, and they were kind of discouraged with him because he was their leader and took them out to fight a battle and come back and all their wives gone and so forth, and there was nobody there to encourage David. You know, there's a power of encouragement. Sometimes, I said on last Wednesday night, that sometimes wives, you need to encourage that man. You see, he's out there, and, and a man has some challenges a lot of times that a woman doesn't have. I know some of the women have taken the household, start work and so forth, and they don't know where the man is and so forth like that. But if you get one that come there, encourage him, praise God. <laughs> encourage a man. A man needs encouragement because the enemy is still after the male seed. He's still after that male seed. Why? Because God said to him in the garden when he had Adam and Eve to sin like that, God told him to his face. He said, the seed of a woman is going to bruise your head. And a man carries the seed. Say amen to that. All right. So uh, then the Bible says, look what it says in verse 6. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David saith, encourage himself. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself. Go to the Word of God. Get along with God. Say, God, I need some encouragement. I don't have none here at the house. I don't, nobody in the church seemed to be reaching out to me. It looks like things are going wrong in my job and my supervisor don't understand what I'm trying to say. Lord, give me some encouragement and God will help you encourage yourself. Praise the Lord. But the enemy is after our soul. And another thing that the enemy will try to do is he'll try to make you become anxious about things. And the Bible says, be anxious for what? Nothing. Nothing. It says, take no thought, saying. In other words, you might have a thought, but don't take it. Glory to God. Let that thought pass on by, if not the thought of God. But he tells you what to think on. Think on these things. Whatsoever things are true and honest and just. That's found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Now, the other thing here is that the enemy will bring trials, tribulations, and pressures of life. Turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, please. Glory to God. That's all the way by, by, back by the book of Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 4. Hallelujah. Got to cover this for you. This is for you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <clears throat> Now, I advise you, if you want to catch up to see where we are and what we talked about last time, the 11 o'clock service on last Sunday, <clears throat> I really had a chance to uh, pour a lot of it out. So uh, I'm connecting this with that. Look what it says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. So don't think it's strange when the enemy comes against you with fiery trials, as if some strange thing happened. You're not on the devil's side, and the devil doesn't like you. Matter of fact, he hates you. So he tries to send people sometimes to do things or say things that might try you. It'll try your patience. It'll try your love. Verse 13, but rejoice. Boy, that's a key right there to come against what the devil is trying to do to your soul. Rejoice. Hallelujah. The Bible says over in, even Jesus even teaches over there, when the, they persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, he said, rejoice. Glory to God. 
Boy, that's hard to rejoice when somebody just come and told you somebody mess around with your fiance. Boy, that's hard to rejoice, ain't it? But you got to rejoice. Glory to God. Come on, rejoice. Hallelujah. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Are you still here with me? Now, so there's a war against the soul. Now, the other thing that the enemy will put or uh, try to bring on your uh, soul is pressure. Somebody say pressure. pressure. And that's a lot of what's happening today. The enemy tries to bring pressure. Come on over here to Daniel chapter 3, please. And over in Daniel chapter 3, that's kind of an interesting scripture here uh, that I want you to see, an interesting account. Now, this is when um, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, that they had gotten together, the people that worked for him, and they had, apparently they had been put up a, an image, and people were to bow down to that image and worship it when the music sounded. Now, there were three in that kingdom at that particular time that were Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and a big Negro, uh, Bendigo. Uh, and, uh, and there were three in that, that was just a little joke there, a little joke, don't get, no, don't get offended. All right, now, but there were three there in that kingdom that were Jewish, and they didn't bow down. Well, that's what these counselors and the people that worked for the king wanted anyway, because the enemy doesn't like you. He wants you out of the program. So what happened was they brought him to the king, said, king, when the music sounds, they don't bow. So they came to the king, and the king said in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake unto them and said, Is it true? My Lord, O oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve the gods, my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, so, uh, harp, sackbolt, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand. Come on, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, don't misinterpret the scriptures. It says, but if not, meaning that if you don't throw us in there, we still won't bow down. Don't think that means if not, if we don't escape. That's not what it was talking about, because if they don't escape, they're going to burn up anyway, so bowing down is not an, even an issue anymore. So you don't see what that's saying. Now, I'm saying that because some people taught it that way, and because of that, uh, some people think uh, that they're going to get burned up. And, and so forth, but that's not true. Now, the pressure's on. So here's a key that you should remember, that when you find yourself uh, making a decision to relieve the pressure, you are making a decision for death and cursing. When you find yourself making a decision purely to relieve the pressure. You have just made a decision for death and cursing. The reason why they didn't burn is because they didn't bow. You see, the enemy will put pressure on you to run, get a divorce. I'm going to hit home. I thank you. Y'all can take it. See, you can't let, that's what I'm saying. The war is at your soul. 
He, he is coming to put pressure on the mind for you to make the decision he wants you to make. See? And, and I went through that. I mean, it's on the tape for the last last month, but I went through that in my life. And, and God has prepared something for you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hallelujah to Jesus. Glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Folks, it's tight, but it's right. Amen. We're going to get your victory. You, you got the victory already. See, I'm just, I'm just trying to show you the way out. Amen. See, and, and he puts pressure on people. And the people of the world, they can't stand because they don't have what you've got. They don't have the Holy Ghost. Come on, they don't have the anointing. They don't have the Word of God, the blood of Jesus, the angels. They don't have all of that. They don't have prayer. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. That word temptation translates test or trial. So there is no temptation, test, or trial taken you, but such is common to man. But God is what? Amen. Is faithful, who will not suffer you to be, come on, tempted above that you are able. But, now we got this in writing but will with the temptation also, come on, make a way to escape, come on, that you may be able to bear it. Now realize that the enemy is after the soul. The war is in the mind, and he's after the soul. What? Decision. So he's trying to make you to make a decision, especially a quick decision. See? But God promised you in writing He's got a way of escape. In every situation you got pressure on right now, God has a way of escape. Now, when he makes you escape, you'll escape to a higher place. You, you, you'll hit the landing. You'll hit some solid ground. You'll, you'll come out victorious. You won't be ashamed. But here it is right here. Now, we got to renew our minds, see, because if this is not known, if, the, if these principles are not uh, understood by you, then you'll think that I just got to go this way. I, I just can't, I can't take this no more. And the world is under pressure right now. The enemy, as soon as it won't do something, he won't do it, put a little pressure on them. And I'm telling you, put pressure on them, they'll cuss you. Come on, you, you, just stay with me. Y'all y'all, y'all, all right, aren't you? Can we talk this morning? No. Let's, can we keep going here? Okay, so in this, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you will. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says here in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So our battle is not in the flesh. Say amen to that. For the weapons of our warfare are not what? Carnal. That means uh, merely human weapons. But mighty through who? God. That means divine potency. To the pulling down of what? Stronghold. Now, I used to think that meant you going up on the mountain, up in Sears Tower somewhere, pulling down stronghold. This is talking about your mind. The strongholds that the enemy has tried to stack up in your mind that in the God has, has got weapons to pull those things down. Amen. Amen. The enemy might be trying to tell you you're not worthy. You, 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 can't, you can't do what other people can do because look at you. Look what you've been through. Folks, you can go in that Bible and pull that stronghold down. I went in that Bible, and some people are still feeling guilty now about what you did in your past. Let me tell you what you got. First place, you got the Word of God. You go to the Word of God and find out who you are. And the Bible says any man that is in Christ is a new creature. It says old things are what? Passed away, and behold, come on, all things are made new. Now, you are made new. Say, I'm new. I'm new. You are new. When Jesus took your sins on the cross and went to the grave, and then in three days God did what to him? 
He raised him back up. Did he still have holes in his hand? Did he still have a hole in his side? He wanted to show the disciples that because he wanted to get witness of the fact that he was the same one that took their sin. I'm here to tell you that inside of him was new, though. He was the first man born again from death to life. You see, when you came into the kingdom of God, your body may not have changed. You looked at your hands and they didn't look new. You looked at your feet and they didn't look new too. But inside of you were brand new. The person who did that was dead. The person, glory to God. Can't you see what I'm talking about? So he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made, come on, the righteousness of God. God made you righteous. He made you, you righteous right now. Well, I don't feel righteous. Stop walking by feelings and come on up and walk by faith. Say amen to that. That's the only reason he could take a woman who was at the, at the well and she was talking to Jesus and discovered that he was a prophet and then that he was a Christ and then he set her free and he said that this woman had been married how many times? Come on, five times and was, come on, living with a man, but he still made an evangelist out of the woman and sent her down to the city to witness. Don't tell me what God can't do. Folks, your past is past. It is over. It's under the blood. Oh, you got what I'm saying? I know you look at your hands. We used to sing that old song. I looked at my hands and my hand looked new. I look at the folks and them hands ain't gonna change. If you had false teeth before you got saved, you gonna have false teeth. Are you following what I'm saying? Come on, some of that stuff, it makes put the wrong image inside, see? But you are brand new. You are brand new. Say amen to that. But not only did he clean up you in terms of on the inside, a brand new person. See this body, where do you think the body is going back to? The dust, folks. It's not you. 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 That is your house. Get over it. The woman caught in the midst of adultery. He said to which of you without sin, go ahead and stone her. And they started leaving one by one. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, I don't see any. He said, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. One of the biggest reasons why God's people cannot walk in the deliverance and in the ministries that God has given to them is because they're still dealing with what they did. See, even after you get saved, God made provision. He said in 1 John 1, 9, now there are people that don't like me to preach this because they say, you just giving them a license of sin. Honey, they don't need no license. He said, if you confess your sin, this is what this is for. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. All unri unrighteousness is sin. You see, God has to cleanse you because your mind needs to be cleansed. See, the mind retains the memory of it. But what I need to do is purge my thoughts. And the, the word, the blood of Jesus is the thing that purges it. It's eternal redemption. It's flowing right now from Emmanuel's veins. It's still flowing. And if you let it come on your brain, it'll wash your mind and get all that guilt and shame out of you. My Lord, my Lord. Is somebody here? All you have to do is think about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, listen, he was hauling them off to jail, folks. He said, taking both men and women. That means some mothers whose children were standing in the doorway crying, he hauled them off and had them and testified to have them killed. 
That's how mean religion is. And then he got saved. And then he saw what he had done. And God had to give him a revelation of righteousness. That any man that comes into Christ is born again. He doesn't have a past. He told those people in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, I've hurt no man, I've offended no man. That's the same man that had him hauled off to jail and killing him. You better start saying that because he's after your soul. And the enemy tries to remind you of your past, but your past is past. Never to be brought up to you again by the Lord. Never, never, never. And get over it. Because when you don't, condemnation steals your faith. And faith is the only way you got to receive. How are you going to receive deliverance on the condemnation? You got to keep you clean. Now, there are religious folk that don't want you to be clean. See, God knows that you're a baby. He knows that your mind is not completely renewed yet and you're subject to stumble. But there are people that when you stumble, they're going to talk about you, they're going to point the finger at you because they got the same demon in them that Paul had before he got saved. And I'm talking about them right now and they're looking at me and I'm glad you're looking at me because you need to get that religious devil out of your mind, out of your house, out of your life. with your perfect self. You're always trying to pump yourself up and make yourself seem to everybody to be super spiritual. You ain't super spiritual. The Lord sees your heart. He sees that all you're trying to do is show out. You're just trying to draw attention to yourself. You are so self-conscious, and that's why the, that guilt is still eating you up right now on the private side. Now, if I look at you, it don't mean it's you. I just got to look at somebody. Amen. Come on. The way you set a man free is let him be free. Oh, I didn't mean to hit that. I, that, I see right now. Though. Glory to God. All right, the trinity of the mind, the mind, the will, and the emotions. We said the mind is the intellect or the thought and reasoning part. The will is a choice-driven area. It's a place that you make decisions. And emotions, we said, is the place of your mind where the passion is, the love, joy, hate, love, so forth and so on, and you feel it. We call it the feeling area of the soul. We said for you to sustain your decisions, you're going to have to anchor it with your emotions. So for you to have a thought and have that thought to be sustained, you're going to have to anchor it with something. And the thing that you anchor it with is the emotion. And the emotion is there for a reason. So change, we said that many times people have different hatreds and different things going on in their marriage, so forth and so on. We said if you want to change the way you look at it and change the situation, you're going to have to change your uh, feelings. And to change your feelings, you're going to have to change your focus. All right, now managing your mind. When we are talking about the mind, one of the areas that we're talking about also is the imagination. Turn to Genesis chapter, well, look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, because you're close by. Boy, I didn't mean to do all that preaching. Somebody needed that. Somebody needed that. Somebody needed that. See, a reminder, a reminder. See, when you're, you're reminded of it all the time, that's when you're subject to repeat it. Uh -uh. That's why he doesn't remind you of it. Father knows best. He said, beware of two leavens, Pharisees and the worldly folks. Both sides of the ditch will try to get you. Super religious. We never sin. We don't sin. We don't sin anytime, so forth and so on. And this group over here that just lives in sin. 
God don't want you in either group. Go down the middle of the road, praise God. It's called grace. All right, look what it says here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse uh, 5. Casting down what? Imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? Thought unto the obedience of Christ. All right, now, <clears throat> what is the imagination? Imagination is something imagined or to be seen, something that a thought that is not yet manifested or not yet real in the physical. It could be a revelation from God. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30, please. Imagination is also an appearance of something presented supernaturally to the mind. It implies that uh, something that has been seen th uh, through discernment or perception, an intelligent foresight or mental image produced by uh, something called the imagination. All right. Now, I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 30 because this is key for you too. Proverbs chapter 30. Glory to God in heaven. Let me know when you get there. Over in Proverbs, boy, that's some hard preaching I just did just a minute ago. Somebody needed that. So we're going to cut that devil off in this church. Yeah, I'm telling you, you get new people, brand new people saved, and they feel so guilty because they can't walk like you walked yet and so forth. Why? Because of renewing of the mind. They, they got born again, got the same spirit you got. But we got to train all of that now. Say amen to that. So at that time, you need to encourage, encourage. You, you, need, to, you need to fast a day for them. You know, keep, uh, you follow what I'm saying? That same devil that got cast out, he's coming back to check to see if the house has got anything in it. And you got to pray for those people instead of trying to always make yourself seem so super spiritual. I don't know who I'm talking to, but that's a devil I'm talking to. Yes, sir. Look what it said in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse, let me know when you get there. Where am I? And verse 18, have you got it? Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now you said vision there, but let's, let's take it a step further. Where there is, I'm sorry, probably, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 29. Please forgive me. Proverbs chapter 29. My wife is here to make sure that I stay right on the money. Uh, amen. She's a good woman. God give me, God, yeah, whoa, what, hey, hey. All right. Look at Proverbs chapter 29. I, I was going to go off, but I didn't have much time. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, what? The people perish. But where uh, he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, let me just say this. Write it down because there's a point. I may not have time to do all, finish all this. You can't go where you can't see. You can't go where you can't see. All right? Now, God has given you an imagination. Why? It is the ability or the power of God to go new places in God. <clears throat> My Lord. Now, let's just look at some people who had a vision, of course. Uh, you can go back to Joseph. And you remember Joseph had a big vision. Am I right about it? Now, God showed him where he was going to be a ruler and so forth. Now, notice he could see there. So, because he could see there, he could what? He could get there. See, the imagination is designed by God for you to get things in God. And it's for you to get to the destiny that he has for you. But it's interesting about where you go. You can't go where you can't see. Let me show you something. Turn back to Genesis chapter 13 real quick, please. Genesis chapter 13. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 13. Let me know when you get there. Praise God. All right, you there? In Genesis chapter 13, look what it says here in verse 14. And the Lord has said to Abram, after the lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look on the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou what? Seeth, to thee will I what? Give it, and to thy seed forever. Let's turn that around. If you can't see it, you can't have it. You got it? If you cannot see it, you can't have it. I didn't say natural vision. That's not imagination. That's not the thing I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about that discernment. I'm talking about that revelation. If you can't see it, you can't go there. You've got to see the victory. You've got to see. The, 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 the Hebrews saw something. The God that we serve, for you to be able to go and stand up close to a fiery furnace and somebody's about to fire, yeah, fire you, I mean, put some fire on you, then you know you got to see something to stand up there and some courage. See, the gates of hell shall not prevail against revelation. It can't stop you. The devil can't stop you if you can see it. And what God's people got to do is the renewing of the mind is stop thinking the imaginations of the devil. Stop letting him take television. Say television. television. See, television is somebody telling you their vision. And stop take, taking their vision, putting it in your imagination and seeing that. Instead, go to the Word of God, get some vision from God. He's telling a vision too about who you are and what you got. Take that stimulate your imagination with that and go that direction. Say amen to that. All right, now, glory to God in heaven. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Glory. <laughs> now, let me just cover one more point then. I'm not even done with that. But let, let's go back here to Genesis chapter 11. Look how powerful the imagination is. You ready? Genesis chapter 11. You have it. Say praise the Lord. And the whole earth was one language and one speech. And it came to pass that they journeyed from the east. They found a, a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they made brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to and let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a hut, a what? A name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Now, these were devil worshipers. These were not worshiping God. I'm talking about the power of your imagination even without God. Right. Right. Look what it says here. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is what? One. And they have all one what? language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have come on imagined to do you see the devil also knows the power of the imagination so what he tries to do is stimulate the imagination so that you'll use all the features that you have in your mind and in your soul so that you will build for the kingdom of God. But he don't know who he's messing with. This is Living Words Group, and they don't do that. Hallelujah. God is now going to stimulate your imagination. So I want you to do something. Turn to Genesis chapter, chapter 15 for me. Genesis chapter 15. Glory to God. Woo! Help me, Lord. Help me. Glory to God. Say amen to that. Amen. So in Genesis chapter 15, look what it says here. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Glory to God. Saying, fear not who? Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And behold, Abram, uh, and Abram, behold, uh, and Abram said, behold, to thee you have given me no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not, not be your heir. But he shall come forth out of your own body. He shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look toward heaven and tell the stars if you be able to number them. And he said to him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for what? Righteousness. Now what did God do to stimulate Abram's imagination? Brought him outside. What did he show him? He showed him what? Stars, And when he saw the stars, he asked him to count them, didn't he? And what did Abram say? It's too many. I can't count them. He said, that's how many kids you're going to have. Yes. Now, I'm here to tell you, when you start dealing with God, get ready to deal big. Come on now. 
See, he knows what you can handle. He knows the capacity in you. Last verse. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3, please. Ephesians chapter 3. Glory to God, I didn't get to my... Mm. Woo, 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 woo. All right, Ephesians chapter 3. Have you got it? In Ephesians chapter 3, you know this scripture, but I'm going to say it in a way now that hopefully you can link it up with what we just said. You see, God has given you an imagination. And when I was a little boy, I used to go to those horror movies down there on Saturday down there in Tuskegee. And, 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 and I'd sit in them and I'd sit about two or three of them and look at Wolfman and, and, and Wolfman's mama and... and, and, and and all of them, and then I'd go home, and uh, my dad turned the light out in the room, and, and we had this d double bunk bed, and, and, and my brother would wait till the light got out, and my imagination really start kicking off, and, and then he'd say, mm. <laughs> and I'd try to ignore it. I'd act like it didn't bother me, but he'd keep on. He'd put the pressure on. <laughs> And pretty soon, I would cry out because my imagination had fully developed something that my body began to participate in. And I'd cry out and say, Daddy! And he'd come in there and whoop both of us. But the thing of it is, I got my brother off my back. Now, I'm telling you, <laughs> that the enemy would try to use your imagination. But I'm here to tell you that it's a big imagination because God said this, verse 20, and this is his challenge to you. Now unto him who's able to do, come on, exceedingly, come on, abundantly, come on, above all we can ask, imagine, go to God according to the power that worketh in us. Let me read it out of the Amplified. Now unto him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to do or carry out his purpose and to do superabundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, dreams, visions, imaginations. Let me tell you, you can't think big enough for God. God wants to stimulate your thinking bigger than you ever thought in your life. You're hooked up with a big God. He knows that you got a big imagination and he's going to do big things through you. Give God a hand and that's all I got. Holy God in heaven.